Hey everybody, this is Jordan Grummet, aka Doc G, and we are back on Rewind Week. This was an episode as part of the What's Up Next podcast, the precursor to Earn and Invest with my partner Paul Thompson. This was an audience takeover where we basically invited community members to come on and talk about their biggest financial hurdles when it comes to financial independence. I thought this would be a good time at the beginning of the year to bring this episode back. Remember, this was recorded a few years ago. This was before COVID. And obviously, like I said, the branding on the podcast is different. It was called What's Up Next Then? And you'll get to hear my partner, Paul Thompson, who's no longer with the podcast. I hope you enjoy this episode. It was timeless then, and I think you'll still get a lot of value out of it today. Take a listen. I hope you enjoy. This is Brenda Almas. I'm Brad Finn. This is John Stoy. This is Rachel Fazio, and you're listening to the What's Up Next podcast. So, Paul Thompson, what's up next? Well, Doc, today we're having another audience takeover, and we have listeners who have joined us to discuss their biggest obstacles with money and their pursuit to financial independence. And I'll let each of our guests do a quick introduction before talking about their biggest obstacle. I'm John Stoy, and I'm a recovering investment banker and portfolio manager here in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, on the path to FI while I raise my son and be married to medicine. I'm Brenda Almos. I'm a nurse practitioner practicing in geriatric medicine in Austin, Texas. I've been pursuing financial independence since 2016, and I'm also a real estate investor and I house hack. Yeah, my name is Bradley Finn. I am a 37-year-old physics teacher here in New York. I have been working on my debt and my path to financial independence since September 2017. I'm Rachel Fazio from Little Rock. I'm a FI enthusiast, forensic neuropsychologist in private practice and real estate investor. All right, Brenda, let's start with you. Talk about some of your childhood messages that you learned from your parents about money. I learned that you should seize the day and spend the money that you have because you don't know what might happen tomorrow. And so there wasn't a lot of preparation for the future. Although I was the first person to go to college in my family, I pretty much figured out how to fund that myself. And uh, my parents were always supportive, but even to this day, we definitely have different financial theories about how we manage our money. John, was it the same with you and your household? Uh, Was it a little bit of a YOLO environment? It was exactly the opposite. In fact, probably I'm a little different than uh, the folks on this panel. Uh, My parents are a bit older. Uh, My dad died last year. He was 96 and my mom's 88 right now. And so they were children of the depression and I was their first and only child. And so they got started late and I learned to watch every penny. And so that was really what led me down this path before I ever even knew what FI was. Bradley, did you guys talk about money in your household when you were a kid? We never really discussed uh, saving money. We always discussed working for money to get the things that we wanted in life. Uh, My parents were very big on not giving us handouts. They made us get jobs very early. But once we got that money and we pretty much thought that we were just working to get the things that we wanted, we were never really taught what to do and how to save for that money in the future. Rachel, were your parents savers or were they spenders? You know, interestingly, I don't know about my parents specifically. I feel like I was much more influenced by my grandparents. But I feel like in my family, the common theme whenever something went wrong or, you know, whenever an unexpected expense came up, basically, the, the thing I heard the most was, well, it's just money. I can make more. So that's kind of been the philosophy that, that I learned growing up. Rachel, can you go back and remember when did you get your first allowance and how much did your parents pay you? You know, I don't know that I ever had an allowance. Like, I don't remember it. I don't remember being expected to do chores as a kid. I remember getting money for like birthdays and Christmas and things like that. But I don't know that they ever just gave me money. We had a a family business. And so if I wanted money, I would go and dust the carpet racks and get paid a dollar kind of thing. Brenda, can you remember what your first job was? Was it doing stuff around the house for the family or did you go out and become an employee somewhere? I became an employee when I was 15 and I worked at a summer camp as wait staff. I also didn't really have an allowance. I was an only child because my brother's 12 years older. So from the time I was eight, I grew up pretty much as an only child. So I had a lot of the luxuries that comes with that. But I was also a really good kid, really academic, never caused trouble. And so I think my parents just felt obliged to encourage that by buying me things that I wanted. 
John, tell us about your first job. If I think about it, a couple first jobs. My first job was when my grandmother let me mow the lawn for her and would pay me to do that. But outside of that, I had the typical, feels like Americana first job. I had a paper route and I'd get home from school every day and I'd collect the papers and I'd wrap them and I'd get on my bicycle and ride around town delivering newspapers. And it it was fantastic. I don't know if I liked it at the time as much as I, I look back and like it now, but meeting all my customers and knowing which ones had to have the paper inside the front porch the ones that didn't mind if you threw it on the driveway. Uh, You know, these are important things that, that I didn't realize I was learning at the time. Bradley, did you have a job in high school? I actually got to pick up my first job before high school in my area. There's a lot of local golf courses and being a caddy was something that all of the little kids, I mean, in middle school, we tended to do. It was one of those jobs. It was pretty laid back. You could kind of lie about your age. So we got in there and my mom would wake me up at 4.30 in the morning to get online to caddy. And I pretty much did that, I think, summer sixth, seventh and eighth grade before I entered high school going into ninth grade. So yeah, caddying on a golf course and there was a couple local so you could bounce around. And if it was slow at one golf course or they had having an event, there was always another golf course to go to. Rachel, one of the biggest stress points economically, if you grew up in a relatively stable household, is starting to think about paying for college. Who paid for your college and was it a big discussion at your household? You know, it really wasn't. Again, I feel like, although don't get me wrong, my parents were in my life from especially a financial perspective, my grandparents had a lot more influence because of them starting that family business and they always wanted to pay for all their kids to go to college. So they did that. And then, uh, I was the first grandchild by about 10 years and an only child. And so I don't think there was ever really much of a question, especially because they viewed me as the smart one. They were kind enough to pay for my college and to pay for my master's degree, actually. And so I only had to pay when I started to consider getting a doctorate. So you came out of most of your schooling debt-free, is that right? Yeah, my college, I had no debt. And then in my master's program, the very last, it was quarters at that time, I took my first student loan to to pay to move to start my doctoral program. So I got in like the day before it was due and got my very first student loan for $8,500. Brenda, were college costs a big worry for you? They were actually. I applied to several schools and I went to the one where I had the most scholarship money and it would be closest to home so that my parents wouldn't have to pay a lot of housing costs. So I ended up going to UT Austin and I got about 75% of my undergrad paid for through grants and scholarship. Came out of undergrad with 10000 in student loans, paid that off my first year after undergrad. And then my master's degree was paid by the hospital at which I worked for at the time. So I kept working full-time as a registered nurse while I pursued my master's in nursing to be a nurse practitioner. John, it's one thing paying for college, but you also had to worry about paying for medical school. Was that a big concern for you when you were younger? Well, I guess when I think of married to medicine, I'm married to my wife who's in medicine. I paid for, for I did pay for my graduate school, but it was business school, not medical school. But I, I did have to worry about that. And when I got out of college, I knew that I wanted to get an MBA, but I I didn't know exactly how I would pay for it. So the first thing I did was I moved home with my parents. And luckily, we lived in New Jersey, very close to New York, got my job on Wall Street. And I ended up staying at home, even though my friends were moving into apartments of their own. I stayed at home and I saved basically 85% of my income. So I could pay for grad school without any loans. That was, that was my goal. I did not want to graduate with any debt. And in the end, you actually didn't have any debt when you finished? I did not. Again, I was a little lucky with the kind of job I got right out of college. So I made decent money and my parents, they let me live at home and they actually even charged me rent, but they gifted it back to me when I got into grad school. So all of that worked out to pretty much cover everything. And Bradley, did you finish uh, your education with a lot of debt? Yes, I actually did. And the thing I look back on now that really makes me the most frustrated is I went to state school. So I didn't go to a private school and I fell victim to the guy that went to school but didn't know what he wanted to be. So I bounced around between different colleges and transferred and actually ended up going to about seven different colleges and universities. So when I got out of school, you know, I also was one of those people that took the most amount of money that the bank would give me as a opposed to the amount of money that I actually needed. And I was using extra student loan money that was supposed to be for books and for living. And I was using them for other things. So I actually came out of school 
with about $100,000 worth of debt and uh, my wife also about the same. So when we finally look back in 2017, when we started to really focus on what was going on, we found ourselves $189,000 worth of debt and it was primarily student loans. And did you feel when you entered the workplace that you had to make decisions about what job to take based on financials? No, I I started as an engineer. That was my bachelor's degree. I got that in physics and I was going to be an engineer. And I realized through tutoring and doing things and getting my grad work that I love teaching. And I knew that as a teacher, I was going to take a significant pay cut. And I never thought about that pay cut in accordance to my debt. I knew I'd have an income and I knew that I'd be fine. And I, at that time, was under the pretense that everybody had some sort of debt and student loan debt. So when I took that pay cut to become a teacher, I really didn't think about my loan. And even now, I don't regret that decision. I probably would be debt-free quicker if I had stayed as an engineer. But no, I never thought about it when I made that career change. Rachel, same question to you. Did how much money you were going to make play a role in what career you ultimately decided on? It absolutely did. You know, I was very aware of my student loans. I I don't know why or when it hit me exactly, but I realized it was going to be an issue and looked into repayment programs pretty early. And I realized that there was a big decision to make in terms of going for something like public service loan forgiveness or not. And if you were not going to do that, you had to make a lot more money to make up for that. And so even when I was in my residency, like my residencies weren't eligible for public service loan forgiveness. And then I started the highest paying job I could find in private practice as soon as I could to just start digging myself out of that hole. Brenda, let's talk a little bit about the decision upon nursing versus being a nurse practitioner. How did you make that decision that you wanted to go further and actually get the nurse practitioner degree? Bedside nursing is really difficult. I loved it. And I think that there's definitely a huge reward in taking care of patients at that bedside. But I knew that I had the capacity to go on. And also being a first generation college graduate, I felt like, okay, I'm paving the way here for future generations. And I need to set the standard higher than a bachelor's degree. Not that there's anything wrong with just staying with a bachelor's degree, but I felt like I can do it. There's a state school nearby where it's affordable and the hospital will pay for it. Like, why not? So I'm interested. All of you guys have college degrees. You chose to go to college. That's something that we toy with right now is, is college really the right choice? And is it the state school? I'm curious how many of you would change your path based on what you know now? And is college what it used to be? It appears to me that college isn't what it used to be. But that's really from my vantage point, looking out and reading everything and consuming everything that we you know consume today, especially if we're at all in the FI community because there's a lot of push towards, you know, is it worth the money? And then, of course, even in politics, we hear trade schools versus college. But I'm still of the opinion that if you should or feel you should go to college, you should try to go to college. It's just that you shouldn't go because you think you should go. Is it right? There's those are two different things. I would never trade my college experience for anything, but you know, I could see if I wanted to go down a different path, it might not have been worthwhile. I did an apprenticeship with uh, an electrician in my town during high school, and you know, he had essentially invited me to to stay on with him and and take over his business. It was a sole proprietorship, but to take it over, and and I just knew that wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. It was fantastic, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. And you mentioned the college experience as a part of your answer. Was that the real reason or is it the earning potential? Because I hear that often referred to that you need that experience, but they separate that from the actual earning potential of getting the degree. I guess the way it could sound elitist if I say something like this, but I think the time in college is often worthwhile the time away from home. And so there's a difference as a balance between people who go to commuter schools and go you know, away to school. All of these things help you, in my opinion, expand your horizons. And so that's just what I like to see about college. I agree because in my field in particular, it's a very practical skill. So you have to have college. But there are so many soft skills. That's a hard skill, practicing medicine, right? But the soft skills that come with having to be somewhere on time, being responsible, communicating with your colleague, having cordial conversations, not having an attitude. All of those things are things that you learn in college. And I feel like, yeah, the four years in undergrad and then the three years in my master's taught me so much about how to 
function in the real life workplace? I'm a person that I I went to college because I thought I needed to when I definitely should not have gone to college. I wasn't ready. I probably should have started with an associate's degree or something. I was a lifelong learner, but it didn't know what I wanted to. And when I went to college, I had a pretty good job working in a pizzeria. I had a ton of responsibility. And I think I, I got caught up going to school because I need to. And now years later, as somebody that teaches 18 year olds and I work with kids going to college every single day, there is a total perception that you need to go to school to become successful. And it comes from my experience, even from the guidance counselors all the way up from the parents and the kids put a lot of stress on themselves. And it's really hard. And to John's point, there's a lot of value that comes in going to school and building networks and relationships. But I try and tell kids that you can get that in a workplace. You can get that in a part-time job. And you you can also, I tell them that they micromanage their time. And I definitely did. I thought that a four-year degree was a lifetime. And I tell them that, you know, if they take a year or two off or get their associate's degree, that's only two years in the course of a lifetime as they get older and they realize it's not really a lot of time. So they can build those skills. But as a teacher, I hate that there's such a perception that you have to go to school. Rachel, I'd give you a chance to chime in on there. I know that from our previous relationship that you were pretty confident that you were going to college for very early on. And did you ever consider doing anything else besides being a doctor? Oh yeah, absolutely. I actually think that's one of the reasons my family paid for my college is because like I was in high school, I was in that generation where uh, you could just start to take college classes in high school, the post-secondary educational opportunities program or something like that. So I took those classes because I hated high school so much. I would take any opportunity to get the hell out of there. So I did that. But once I graduated high school, you know, my thought with the family business was, well, I'll just be next in line for the business. I'll just take over the business. Like I don't have to go to college. I don't have to do any of this stuff. And my family said, no, 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 you have to go to college. You're very smart. You're too smart to sell carpet, go to college. So that's what I did. But interestingly, kind of speaking to that whole college experience thing, like I never had the college experience because I started college again when I was in high school. I was 15 when I started going to college and I graduated, I think it was about a month after I turned 20. And I lived at home that whole time. And I did that because I had a dog that I loved and I had horses that I took care of and I showed and somebody had to feed them and water them and groom them and work them. And I was not going to go live in a dorm. That wasn't going to happen. So maybe I missed out on some of those skills. I I may still not have some of those skills, but I really enjoyed doing it the way I did it. So. So you wouldn't change it if you were to go back again? No, I wouldn't. I mean, to be honest, I don't know. It seems like maybe it's, it's a generational thing, but I don't know a lot of people who are still friends with the friends they made in college. There might be something to say for the professional networking, but, you know, I still love dogs and I still love horses and I, you know, still kind of want to live that way rather than stacked in a dorm room. John, let's transition a little bit and talk about what happens after education. How did you find the financial independence movement? What was your first exposure? My first exposure to the financial independence movement really came only like last year. One of my friends, Brian Eufinger, he actually introduced me to the whole thing and started selling them on podcasts. And I started just sort of devouring them. And that's how I got into this whole thing. But what I found that to me was so interesting is that I think I alluded to it before that it all made sense to me, this whole idea of wanting to be FI because of I was in the financial world. And uh, I was on a trading floor and I worked with investment bankers, did investment banking itself for several years. And you guys may have heard the old joke, but the joke starts, what do you call a 40-year-old investment banker? And the answer is a failure. (laughs) So the idea is that you're going to make all this money, you're going to front load all this money that you're going to make before you get old as a 40-year-old, and then you can do whatever you want because that's what you want to do. You want to have that, for lack of a a better word, and I'll keep this lean, but FU money is what they call it right on Wall Street. So that's what you want. And that's FI. Can you remember a specific aha moment? Was there a certain podcast or blog post that you read where it all of a sudden clicked? I can't. I'll tell you, because I started listening to the Choose Five podcasts. Those are the first ones I listened to. And I just started going back, back, back and picking ones that were interesting. And it was more of a, a sort of a slow snowball down the hill for me than an aha moment. 
Bradley, how about you? Was it debt that eventually spurred you to learn about financial independence? Yeah, so it definitely was my debt-free journey. I have a YouTube platform that's been documenting my debt-free journey over the course of the last two years. And in live streams, I had a bunch of subscribers always saying, you know, what's your opinion on fire? What's your opinion on fire? And I never knew anything about it. And I had the pleasure of meeting the Choose FI guys at a conference called FinCon. And they introduced themselves to me and I kind of got curious about it. But knowing that debt was my main priority, I I never really looked that far into it. And then unfortunately with an inheritance back in February, I got very, very close to that debt-free position and now had to focus on what was next after that debt-free life. And that's when I went back and started really reading and focusing on the FI community, going back, reading Mr. Money Mustache and all the things that I'd heard over the last two years, but knew I wasn't ready for. And I've pretty much been all in now, you know, since then. Bradley, how did you land at FinCon so early in your journey? That's usually more of the graduate level once you've been studying this stuff for a while. Yeah, so the the debt-free slash YouTube platform. So I've been on YouTube for over two years. And uh, when I got to FinCon, it was pretty much to grow that brand and to meet people and network through that, not knowing where it would lead me. And it ended up being leaps and bounds for not only just that platform, but also education-wise. I met so many different people and got to see so many perspectives where in my debt-free journey, I was focused on one specific path that was given by one specific person. And, and I didn't realize, you know, that I wasn't alone on an island and that there were so many like-minded people that I could reach out to in this community. And it's done wonders for not only my debt-free journey, but also my path to financial independence. Brenda, can you remember the first time you heard the acronym FIRE and what you thought about it then? I believe I heard it on Paula Pant's Afford Anything podcast, which I had heard about through Stacking Benjamins. And I had purchased Dave Ramsey's book, The Total Money Makeover, probably five years ago, kind of skimmed through it, thought, oh, that's pretty cool. But like, I'm in grad school, so I'm just going to put that on hold, you know? And then around 2016, I started listening to Stacking Benjamins, which led to Afford Anything. And she was talking about being able to do whatever you want with your time. And I was like, what? Because I'm over here doing shift work and studying in my free time. So that was the first time that a light bulb clicked in my head. Like, what if I could do this? What if it's not just the Paula Pants and the Joe Salty highs? You know, what if Brenda almost could do it too? Did you believe it when you first heard it? Did you really think it was possible or did you think they were trying to pull one over on you? I'm not sure. I think I believed it, but I thought it was possible for other people. So I think it's taken a while for me to believe that it's actually possible for myself, especially because I don't have any close role models that have done it. When you see people online, listen to a podcast or read a blog, do those people sound like reasonable role models? Can you identify with them or does it have to be someone in your own close community? I think it's difficult to identify with them just because they have such a big platform and it seems like well, they have all this time to educate themselves on how to be fire and they're already there. So what do they have to lose really? You know, so I think it would be more impactful if it was someone in my close social circle. And so I thought, well, if I don't have anyone, then I'll be that person for the people in my social circle. Rachel, was it daunting the first time you heard about financial independence? Did you embrace it immediately or did it take a while? I think I embraced it pretty quickly. I kind of went down the rabbit hole of, I think, Googling basically how to pay your student loans tax-free kind of thing. (laughs) I was trying to figure out some kind of hack to be able to do that, which still doesn't exist to the best of my knowledge. And then I had to kind of figure out my own retirement plan because in the private practice I was at at the time, there was no retirement plan and things like that. So when I started thinking about it and running the numbers, you know, I, I could see where it was possible. But again, just with the student loans, I saw that I was starting off so deep in the hole that it was going to be challenging. Was there one content producer specifically that spoke to you or one platform that really helped you through? Not so much. I would say that of all the kind of content I've read, The Mad Scientist is one of my favorites. And then there's some that I don't like or don't agree with so much, but I've kind of pulled a little bit from a lot of different platforms. So John, let's talk about what happens after you discover financial independence. Often we have a huge amount of energy going into this journey, but just as anything else, eventually the energy fades and we hit our first roadblock. For you, what has been your biggest roadblock to financial independence? Well, I mean, that the easiest one is really what I call a, you know, involuntary career change. 
as I said, I was lucky. I didn't have any debt when I graduated from school, both schools, got a really good job. I just sort of plowed along and saved. And I mean, I lived in New York and Chicago and I saved 60 plus percent of my income because I figured that this would just happen and I would keep doing it. And magically, some age, I would look at a big pile of money in the bank and I would say, now I'm off to do my next career. And I envisioned all sorts of things like teaching, doing just community service. I had this dream that I would ride the train back and forth from New Jersey to Manhattan and I'd see all this beautiful land that was all strewn with garbage. And I had this dream that once I had my, now you'd call your FI number, once I had that number, I would then form co-op or something to clean up that whole area. And it would just be great. And so all of that was great until this little thing called the financial crisis, right? Happened about 10 years ago. And it sort of put a a stick in my spokes. Since then, you know, I, I have been actually working to get back to an income that could get me to FI. And that's okay, right? Everybody has different paths. But to me, that was the big bump. And realizing that through listening to these podcasts, and I said I came to it only recently, it's actually reinvigorated me. Because I would say over the last five years, there were plenty of times where I said, it's just not going to happen. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd analyzes companies across the global private market, selecting those with the greatest growth potential, then brings them to you. From personalized medicine to cybersecurity to robotics, quantum computing, and more, in state-of-the-art labs, startup garages, and anywhere in between, our crowd is identifying innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest early. Our crowd accredited investors have already invested in over $1 billion in growing tech companies. Now you can invest in Bluetree, who could revolutionize the billion-dollar-plus total addressable food tech market. Bluetree has developed a process to significantly reduce the sugar in any natural liquid, lowering health risks while retaining great taste. Bluetree has already signed a five-year, 100 million liter contract with an industry leader. Invest in Bluetree at rcrowd.com slash EAI. You can join our crowd for free. That's O-U-R-C-R-O-W-D dot com slash E-A-I. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community at our crowd dot com slash E-A-I. Bradley, talk a little bit about roadblocks. What have you found has stood in the way of the easy path to financial independence for you? I think the obvious one is the debt that I had. That 189000 over the last two years has been something to really tackle. I live in a very, very high cost of living area where it's, you know, just property taxes alone make it very hard to rent. I was always for renting if I could. But for example, I live on less than a quarter acre and have $13,000 a year in property taxes. So to rent, you essentially are paying two mortgages. So at that point, you might as well buy and save up. So I think that cost of living has been a little bit of a roadblock. And then just like anything, I think we all have personal situations. My dad was sick and I spent a lot of time with him where I could have probably been working on side hustles and things, but that's just life. But the things that I look for in the future definitely involve, you know, getting rid of that debt, which has been a major roadblock for me, as well as, you know, possibly moving to a position or an area where I can live with the same means and, you know, but avoid some of these high cost of living areas that I have here in New York. Bradley, are we being a little dishonest, us content producers? Do we make it seem too easy? I don't think that we make it too easy. I think that a lot of times it's easy for people to point their fingers from behind a computer screen. But no, I think that we're more of a resource. And I think people need to understand that as content creators, we're just trying to lead by example and, and create a journey. And I can't speak for everyone, but I know on my platform, it's it's very, you know, this is just what I'm doing and I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to hit roadblocks and I'm going to have ups and downs. And I think that a, a content creators do an amazing job of painting a pretty good picture. Some people have had easier past than others, but I don't think anybody quote unquote got lucky. I think everybody that I've read and who I've listened to worked really, really hard and made extreme sacrifices to get to the point that they're at. And I want to be the same type of person. Brenda, can you talk a little bit about your roadblocks? 
Yeah, I feel like I'm going to sound like a really basic millennial, but I think FOMO is a big one. Like fear of missing out because my generation, we're all about posting our best moments on Instagram and Facebook and my friend's weddings and my friend's trips and my friend's new cars and their new homes. And so I feel like how much of that has influenced my consumerism and how much is it also the fact that I grew up feeling like having things is what shows that you're successful. And so I've had to do a lot of inside work. I think just figuring out like, why do I want all these things? Is it because I'm scrolling past them every day and other people have them? And I think that I'm not going to measure up if I don't have them also, or is it because I genuinely want and need them? So I feel like that's been a major roadblock and also just lack of saving habits. You know, I'm the total opposite of John who grew up counting every penny and For me, it was like, just make it rain. You know, if you have it, spend it. So I had to kind of untrain myself to not associate my spending with my self-worth or my ability to spend with my self-worth. So Rachel, Brenda mentioned FOMO and she mentioned spending and self-worth. Have those been major hurdles for you? And if not, what have been? I don't think they have. I don't know how to explain it, but not being a super like extroverted person and always kind of doing my own thing, like being the 15 year old at college and whatnot, I've always had to kind of go, meh, whatever, and and do my own thing. So I, I don't feel like I've felt that pressure so much. You know, my primary hurdles, I think, to achieving financial independence, a couple things. One is the student loans. Those are an ever-present source of just impending doom in my life. And it's interesting because the older generations, like my friends and family who are 10 or 20 or 30 years older than me, they didn't understand that and they haven't understood my fixation on getting rid of them. So that's been a big hurdle. And looking forward, I think another hurdle is going to be healthcare for me, being self-employed. That's something that I'm very concerned about. Well, Rachel, I'm familiar with your story. I'd like for you to share a little bit with the audience. What have you done from a lifestyle design to overcome those obstacles? So I started off on a graduated repayment plan, which is, you know, it's a typical 10-year repayment window, but with the graduated repayment plan, it starts off low and it adjusts every two years. Maybe it's changed, but at least when I signed up for it, that's what it was. But you didn't have to produce any kind of proof of income. Like there was no percentage, there was no nothing like that. So I thought, okay, let me just do this, get on my feet, get this private practice up and running and start paying these suckers off. So I did that. And then after, actually it was about the time the payment was going to go up is when I started looking into refinancing. So I have refinanced those student loans. I can't tell you how many times because each time the rate has gone down, you get a refi bonus, you know, it's all good. I've probably gotten a couple thousand dollars just in refi bonuses by refinancing repeatedly. So that's been good. And then most recently, as the balances have shrunk, you can only refi if it's above a certain amount. And what I did, and and this is something potentially for listeners to think about, is when I refinanced these loans, I tended to do them per loan. I did not consolidate them because I knew if I consolidated them into one payment, I would be making that one payment until that payment was gone. So if it was $1,000 a month, it was going to be $1,000 a month. Whereas if I did them individually or in smaller chunks, I could pay them off. I could kind of snowball it, pay them off a couple at a time, and then put that cash flow towards something else. So that's what I've done. And as they've gotten into the smaller chunks, I've opened like 0% interest, zero transfer fee credit cards. And I've started transferring them onto those credit cards to take the interest even from 4% down to 0% until I can pay them off. So I've just really tried to expedite that as mathematically efficiently as possible. John, as I listen to Rachel talk, I think about this idea of financial independence. And what I think is the superpower of our community is not financial independence. It's not finding the pathway or even going down the rabbit hole. I think our superpower is that we hit these hurdles and then we have to find a way to get past them. And that was one of our major reasons for wanting to have you guys on the podcast today is to show that we all face these hurdles in our financial independence pathways. Tell me about how you found a way to get past this hurdle. You mentioned the financial crisis 10 years ago. You mentioned your income not being where it was before. How have you found ways to continue this pathway even with the significant roadblock that's been thrown up? 
That's a great question. And I will say that I agree with you that having this community is so helpful because um, like I think everybody's mentioned, just knowing other people are on that path and working towards it and knowing not everybody succeeds right away. We all have different FI numbers and FI dates and things like that. I probably threw up some roadblocks of my own over the course of time. Right after I lost my last banking job, I decided that I didn't like the fact that other people were basically taking my living away because of X, Y, or Z reason. So I decided to become an entrepreneur and I opened up a small business and I went from selling securities and investing in bonds to selling sushi. I won't bore anybody with a long and drawn out story today, but it was an amazing learning process and it was an amazing way to spend a lot of my retirement money at the wrong time. I didn't take any money out of qualified accounts, but I definitely spent down savings, ran a company, sold it, but selling the company just uh, meant I paid off the debt that I'd built running it. And so that didn't do any good. And luckily I've had a wife that could you know help us through this process, but finding the way to get your own foot, one foot in front of the other every day. That's been my thing. And uh, like I said, it's really been helpful to have this community. And so I know that, okay, maybe I can actually do it again. And I can actually help other folks achieve that goal as well. So Bradley, we always say that there is a simple path to wealth. There's a simple path to financial independence, but it isn't always easy. And I think it's not easy because of those roadblocks we're talking about. What do you tell your average listener listening today who's right there stumbling over one of these hurdles? What advice can you give them to have them not turn around and run the other way, so to speak? I think what people need to understand is that our human nature is to micromanage exactly what's going on in a small time frame. And it can get really, really daunting when you look ahead at, at a long journey or a mountain of debt. And I think even with investing, if you come from the hold and wait long term, if we could kind of expand our life and see you know, how long things are going to be and how long we're going to be around and look at it from that aspect. It seems really, really cheesy and cliche, but I really try and preach positivity as well. And you know, making all the other things in your life amazing outside of debt and financial independence, which has helped me because I found that I only had a certain amount of control on how much debt I could pay off or how much money I could save. But I also knew that I was going to need to incorporate other parts of my life to become an overall better person. And I try and tell people like, if you're getting down on yourself about paying off debt, you know, work on your health, work on, you know, how good are you being as a parent or an employee or, and, you know, try and perfect other things in your life that you do have direct control. And as a byproduct, generally, by making all those other things better, you're going to rise as a whole. And that's going to make your path to financial independence or your debt-free journey better as well. Brenda, you ever want to turn around and run? You ever think, I just want to dish this financial independence thing and move on with life? No, I know too much now. I would try, but I think that I would know that I was on the way and I could have done it. And I would regret that more than being able to spend however I want, especially being a high earner, not rich yet millennial. I think that there have to be some of us who pave the way for the rest of the millennials and Generation Z to pursue this path. Rachel, have you ever found that it goes too far, that you've been so aggressive in your financial independence planning that you've had to back up and say, whoa, wait a second here. I don't need to get there that fast. I don't know that that's happened. But what I will say is that when you have had six figures of student debt, a lot of things become less intimidating. So like my friends, for example, who are pursuing FI who don't have six figures of student loan debt, most of them don't do real estate. Why? Because, ooh, it's risky, you know? And I'm like, well, what's the worst that can happen? I have another 100000 to pay off? Like it's, you know, no biggie, whatever. <laughs> so maybe too aggressive in that sense, but it's been a good fit for me. I want to go through the panel. We'll start with John. How far away do you think you are from financial independence as of today? Oh my gosh, I'm so far away that it would scare everybody on this panel. And and the reason why I say that is that I've already had two different dates that I had in my head just implode. And so my wife and I, we've put the date at our goal is the day our son graduates from college. If it happens before then, that's awesome. But we've got a few more years. We've got about a dozen more years to go. Bradley, do you have a date and a time set on your calendar already? Yeah, my wife and I, we are very analytical people. So I have a a spreadsheet that changes daily. But our goal is I have a 15-month-old daughter and one on the way. And 
We pretty much have looked at when my daughter is going to be entering first grade, uh, which is in about three or four years. And we have kind of like a different perception of Phi. For us, our goal is to be able to get enough money where we can take a teaching pay cut. We do so well. Not many places in the country offer six-figure salaries to high school teachers. And my wife and I, we both get awarded that. And our main goal isn't so much to retire, but ours is to be able to move to a place that we can seek adventure and that we really love that, you know, we could take that teaching pay cut because essentially I'd be taking almost a 40 to 50% pay cut with my experience anywhere I went. So we're looking at four years when my daughter goes into first grade and uh, that's hopefully what our goal is going to be. Brenda, same question to you. Do you have a specific time you think you'll be financially independent? And on top of that, do you think you'll retire when that day comes? So if I were to use the 4% rule, I could retire around the time I'm 45. So I'm 29 now. But I think I could probably go part-time like you, Doc, in about five years because I've significantly cut my cost of living because I house hack. And so that pays for a big majority of my housing costs. And then when I do, quote unquote, retire, I really like that Paula Pant encourages us to think not what we'll retire from, but what we will retire to. And I really like practicing medicine. I like taking care of seniors. I like being there to encourage them and motivate them and make them feel good. And so I don't think I would want to stop that altogether, but I would want to practice in healthcare on my own terms and perhaps start some kind of nonprofit for people who lack healthcare access. Rachel, I feel like Brenda is starting to get into the territory of our why of FI. So we spend a lot of time talking about financial independence, but I think all of us recognize that money is just that. It's just numbers. But we enter this pathway because we see something greater of more meaning and purpose ahead of us. What is your why of FI? What will you do when you become financially independent? I think that's hard to answer. I don't have some huge, overwhelming life purpose type of thing going on, to be quite frank. I actually recently did just work through Tanya Hester's book, Work Optional, and and she talks about kind of creating a mission statement. And really, I kind of want to do it just to do it for the autonomy and, you know, ability to adventure and learn new things and just not wake up to an, an alarm clock, stuff like that. I fortunately or unfortunately, again, don't have some driving mission I'm trying to accomplish behind it. Do you ever worry you'll wake up and be bored because you won't know how to fill your days? I am an only child. We don't get bored. We learned from an early age how to entertain ourselves. So no, I mean, can I go to the gym and I have a dog and I want to learn Spanish and learn an instrument and maybe have a horse again? I doubt that I'm going to be bored. So John, to you, same question. What is your YFI? What will you do once you get there? So what I want to do is sort of what I'm doing, but not worry about having to pay or to get paid for it, which is kind of crazy. So maybe it's crazy because I'm doing financial planning for folks. And I, I went through a, a period where I, I tried to, to do it with a company that, that wasn't the right fit at all. Uh, and what I ended up doing was uh, about a year of pro bono financial planning for folks. And it was extremely rewarding. I worked for people who didn't basically have that much money, didn't know anything about FI. I mean, you name it, they didn't know it. And it was, as I said, very rewarding for me, but I didn't make a dollar for a whole year. And so that's not so special when you're trying to go for FI, right? As me. And so what I would like to do when I hit my number or when we get to our the point in our family where, where we can take that part-time whatever you want to call it. I want to do that and just have no pressure. And Bradley, certainly work will play a role in your YFI. Is that right? Yes, it definitely will. My YFI is definitely time. Before my daughter was born and before I had kids, I had no problem with debt. I had no problem spending because I was YOLOing and I I didn't need to die with any money. And you know, the debt-free thing was more of just freeing up income to travel more and things like that. But then when my daughter was born, I read an amazing article that talked about how when your kid graduates high school, you've probably already spent 93% of the total time you're going to spend with them already. And that really, that's what drove me forward towards FI and which is really lighting the fire under my butt to make it happen as quickly as possible. Because for me, my YFI is strictly time with my daughter and my son on the way. And as a teacher, you hear what people say. I essentially have a part-time job, weekend, summers, and holidays off. So I'm already awarded so much amazing time with my daughter, which almost makes it harder to go back to work because I really get to see 
you know, how much value we have with one another. But my YFI, you know, I'll always want to be a teacher. I love educating. I love the blog. I love the YouTube platform. But every day when I wake up and I think about my savings rate and I make decisions on spending, it sounds cliche, but it's all about my kids. Well, Bradley, I'm going to turn it right back to you and close out our conversation with our original question is what was was your biggest obstacle and what would you be your advice to somebody who might share your biggest obstacle in their path to financial independence? So uh, my biggest obstacle is debt. And I think that you have to understand that you might have made some mistakes all the time I hear, well, I wish I would have known now what I knew then. And you know, that that's a great philosophy, but we're here in the now and there are amazing resources. There's amazing people. You know, there's like-minded people everywhere and there's people with all sorts of debts and all sorts of incomes. And I tell people, you know, really try and find those people and use them as rocks and understand that you're going to have up and bad. You're going to have up days and down days and great months of paying off debt and some days where you just make the minimums, but it's a long road and it snowballs over time. And, you know, once you get over the initial hump of that, that change of lifestyle, you realize that it gets really, really good as time goes on. And the person you become who's capable of doing that, to Rachel's point, is somebody who can conquer the next big mountain, which I think is the really good takeaway from all this. We have challenges, right? And so when you become the kind of person who can conquer them, then what, right? You can really lead the life of that you really want. I've never been more excited for life. Both my parents died young and I, I always assumed that that was going to be my path. And, you know, making these decisions, not only with my life, but financially at 37 years old, I've never been more excited to be 80. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Rachel, how about you? Let's give you the chance to answer that last question as well. Your biggest challenge and your advice to people who are listening that might share that same challenge. You know, I think with overcoming student loans, the thing that maybe doesn't occur to some people is just kind of to take that entrepreneurial approach. Doing what everybody else is doing is what led to the student loan crisis. So you kind of have to think outside the box in order to get yourself out of that jam. And in your case, it was some lifestyle design and real estate and uh, just being really smart with your payoff strategy, right? Again, I think the kind of refinancing I talked about earlier is one thing. I think the fact that I did kind of go into private practice and I have some unusual payer sources and stuff like that, that's something that a lot of the people I went to grad school with aren't doing. I know because I'm in their Facebook group and I see their student loan balances. So <laughs> apparently I'm the only one doing some of these things. But yeah, real estate was also kind of a way to expedite that process. So yeah, just overall think outside of the box and take some unusual tactics, I would say. Awesome. Thank you for helping. Uh, John, how about you? The challenge that you face and what your advice would be to the other folks who might share your same challenge. For me, it's a little bit of what Brad said, but it's mental. It's knowing that you could still go forward, take another step, spend plenty of time regretting decisions, more time than we should, but we all do it. I mean, there was one decision that I made in the summer of 2010. Had I made that decision one you know, stroke differently, I'd be fine now, but that didn't happen. I didn't make that decision and that's okay. It's suboptimal, but it's okay because, you know, we're moving forward and to have groups like this to get other people to sort of keep you moving forward. That's what I would do. Wonderful. Brenda, how about you? What kind of challenge do you both most resonate with? What's your biggest struggle and how would you advise somebody else who is having the same issue? I think my challenge is being intentional with my spending. So those are my two things is intentionality and then focusing on delay of gratification. Because sometimes when you work really hard to have a high income, then you get that high income and you want to be able to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So for me, I have really had to work on with every major purchase or even just my eating out spending to think, do I really want this or am I just trying to pass the time? Could I just make a sandwich at home or do I need Chick-fil-A for the third time this week? And then also always remembering that whatever sacrifice I may be making today, it will reap some reward in the future. And I know there's a lot of controversy about Dave Ramsey in the FI community, but I really like what he says about living like no one else so that later you can live and give like no one else. So Brenda, where can we find you if someone wants to get a hold of you and what is up next for you? So I am pretty active on the FI Twitter community at Almost Brenda. I don't have a blog and I don't have a podcast yet, but I am working full time managing my real estate property and continuing on this FI path. 
Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining. This has been a, a lot of fun. Thank you so much. John, we'll give you a chance to promote anything that you're doing. Where can we find you? And what is up next for you? Okay, for better or for worse, probably for worse in terms of time management, uh, I'm all over social media and, and all my settings are public. You can find John Stoy on anywhere. But I just recently opened up an office here in Atlanta. I do flat fee, fee only financial planning for folks. So that's a uh, SafeBridge is the name of the company and it's mysafebridge.com. Well, look forward to checking that out at mysafebridge.com. Thank you for being on here. Bradley, how about you? Where can we find you on your YouTube channel? I was not previously aware of your YouTube channel, so I'm really looking forward to checking that out. I'm a uh, novice at my YouTube channel, so I'll take some notes from you. And or what is up next and where can we find you? Right on. So the easiest way I think is the finmindset.com slash connect. That's going to lead you everywhere to all my social media platforms, the fin mindset, everywhere you go. The YouTube channel is also called the fin mindset. And uh, the blog is new. I think I have about six or seven articles. That's the next step for me. Wonderful. Rachel, where can we find you and what is up next for you? Well, I have a guest post on Phiology about some real estate investing that I did, if anybody has interest in that. I also have a very neglected, sad little blog, dousingthefire.com, where I talk a lot about how terrifying it was to transition into my own private practice. And then I'm also an admin of the Choose FI Little Rock group. So you can find me there if you happen to be in Arkansas. All right. Well, this has been the What's Up Next podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, and my co-host, Paul Thompson, we would like to thank John, Bradley, Brenda, and Rachel. That's a wrap. This is Rachel Fazio, and you're listening to the What's Up Next podcast. Wow. You should take my job. <laughs> you don't know this about me, Paul, but I used to be a DJ. Yeah, oh, you told me. You I, I, remember. I remember. You have the voice for it, for sure. Uh, I've got some competition now. Okay, John, you ready to, to have your turn? Give me sure. a thumbs up. Okay, in three, two, one. This is John Stoy, and you're watching or listening to the What's Up Now podcast. Obviously, I've got to do that again. <laughs> You've, 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 I've already, I've already messed it up. So we're, well, we've now, we, now we have our first blooper. So it'll be perfect. <laughs> I like that. Just another hundred thousand. No biggie. Yeah. <laughs> that should be a meme. You can't scare me. I have student loans. <laughs> That's true. That's right. Chick-fil-A is my weakness as well. So I resonate with that. <laughs> yes, I understand.